I am thrilled to kick off this panel discussion by introducing our panelists here today. We've got three great individuals who work on various aspects of retirement planning. On my on your far left is Rob Berger. Rob is the founder of robberger.com and the Financial Freedom Show. He has a YouTube channel where he has interviewed a lot of folks. He's interviewed me. I know he's interviewed a lot of people who work on retirement planning. He has also published a book called Retire Before Mom and Dad. And Rob was a fairly early retiree and often writes about how he was able to achieve that and how he manages draw down during a fairly long time horizon. John Luskin is here in the middle of our three panelists. John, many of you know, um, does a lot for us in the Bogleheads community. He holds ho hosts the Bogleheads Twitter spaces where he has man managed to land some amazing guests. And I believe those are all recorded for posterity. So if, like me, you're not sure how to operate Twitter spaces, you can uh, replay them. Um, he also is the producer of the Bogleheads Live podcasts, and John is a certified financial planner. He's fee-only, advice-only. And last but not least, Steve Chen is here to my immediate right. Steve is the founder and CEO of New Retirement, which is a fabulous resource, a great website, a financial planning platform that includes some do-it-yourself software for retirement planning, articles, podcasts, um, access to CFPs, importantly. They will help you find a CFP that, that matches what, what you're looking for. So we thought um, for this session that we would dive into some of the big questions that cross our minds as we approach retirement and as we move into retirement. So at the top of the list, I thought um, we would kind of think about people in the 55 to 70, 65 year range, uh, the pre-retiree range, and one thing that they might be thinking about is how to think about spending in retirement, how much you'll spend in retirement. There are these rough rules of thumb, like the 80% income replacement rate. But I think a big question for people embarking on retirement today is, with inflation as it is, how should I think about how much I'll actually spend in retirement? Steve, you want to take that? Uh, sure. Uh, thanks, Christine. So I think for a lot of our users, they definitely, uh, when they're preparing, are measuring expenses, taking a close look at what they're actually spending, breaking it down, building budgets, so they have a good handle on what's happening. Uh, and then as they transition, I think a, a big consideration is, are they going to make any giant gear shifts? So if they're thinking about relocating, will that change their expected expense ratio? Like I live in California, if I was going to move to Florida, would my cost of living be lower? You know, my, my tax rate uh, from a state income tax perspective would be different. So th that kind of factor would go into it. You know, and I think at, at a high level, um, you know, what Michael Kitza says and some of the research he's posted about spending in retirement, it does <clears throat> tend to decline over time. So, you know, I think on, av on average, people can expect that their expenses will decline about 1% on a real basis every year. So about 10% per decade. And if you you know, if you step back, and I think a lot of people are really, hey, I'm planning on having the same spending rate at 85 as I have at 60, and the reality is that for most people, that's not true. You know, you're going to be spending a lot less at 85. You're going to be traveling or moving less, typically. You know, you're going to be, your, your costs will be generally lower. Um, so you shouldn't necessarily over-save and over-optimize for, you know, long, long time horizons and, and, and think about, using some of your ass, you know, spending more earlier to enjoy your human capital. Uh, so uh, David Blanchett did some research on this, the retirement spending smile, so folks can check that out and talks about that phenomenon. Spending does decrease as you move through retirement. In those earlier years, those go-go years, you're gonna wanna travel, you're gonna go out to that fancy restaurant, but then as you get older, you're not gonna wanna do that stuff, and maybe it's just gonna be at the soup plantation for you at that point. So. Spending on a real basis does decline throughout retirement. Now, related question I get from a lot of folks is, can I retire? And then my question to them is going to be, well, how much are you spending? And a lot of folks don't necessarily know the answer to this. And this is where I ask them to, all right, now you've got, got to go out and do some homework. You've got to track your spending and figure out what you actually are spending, what you're spending it on. Now, this doesn't have to be a hard or difficult process. There's a couple 
or gosh, there's more than a couple, great financial tools that can help you with this process. Mint.com is a free tool that can help you track your spending. It's going to categorize your spending. You need a budget.com is also a popular tool. It's not free. It's $12 a month or something nominal like that. And I mentioned those tools because those are a couple of tools that the folks that I work with, a lot of do-it-yourself investors, a lot of bogleheads seem to like a lot. So that's going to be a big part of the early steps of retirement planning, figure out what you're spending and figure out what categories you're spending is in, and that's going to help you with your retirement planning. Okay. So another question on our list um, was Social Security, and if um, my guess is that many, most of you were in Mike Piper's great session earlier where he talked about the various dimensions of developing a Social Security strategy. But one thing I wanted to pick up on, I was looking on the boards where we ask people for questions, so on the Bogleheads forum, um, and a great question came up is that I think a lot of people understand why they should delay Social Security, but the question is, how do you bridge those years from when you retire to when you eventually begin claiming benefits? Where do you go for those funds? I guess Mike somewhat addressed that, but maybe you, you all can talk about that. And also what those funds should be invested in in the years that you were, are drawing more heavily upon your portfolio than you might later on when Social Security comes online. Rob, maybe you want to tackle that one? Well, I take a, uh, I don't know if it's a controversial view. I don't feel that it is. But in terms of where you should invest your money, even as you're spending it, I, I kind of view you should have an asset allocation. I think for most retirees, it's in the 50 to 75% range for stocks, and that's a gross generalization that won't apply to countless situations. But when we think about safe withdrawal rates and that sort of thing, if you go back to Bill Bingen's work and Guyton Klinger and you know, others, uh, that's generally where they say your stock allocation should be. And I think that's true even if you're you know, uh, 60 and you're taking out money before you take Social Security uh, when you're 70. And I'm just a big believer and you, you pull the money out, maybe it's gonna come from dividends and interest in a taxable account first, and then maybe you're selling shares and whatever accounts make the most sense you know, from a tax uh, perspective, and then you're just rebalancing. Uh, and others might wanna hold more cash just to have some level of comfort, and that becomes, I think, just a, a personal decision, you know, as long as it doesn't become too much cash, in which case, other than in 2022, <laughs> uh, might might weigh on the portfolio a bit, but I think it comes down to a lot of personal preference at that point. Okay, so I wanna follow up on that because there was another question on the boards about in retirement asset allocation, what that should look like. And this question was starred and asterisked by several users, so I wanna make sure we get to it. The question is, if someone has, say, a pension and social security that is supplying much of their income needs, how should the portfolio be invested? And, and how do, how do non-portfolio income sources like Social Security and pension affect what the asset allocation should look like? Anyone? Yeah, can I, I wanna just back up one second to talk about the Social Security timing question. So one thing a lot of our users talk about is using that window. So they're delaying Social Security to try to maximize their lifetime income, protect their spouses, right? All that good stuff. But they're also, it creates, you know, many of them, if they have the opportunity, they can engineer their income levels over multiple years. And they're trying to create this window where they can do Roth conversions. And so in an ideal world, they walk into that environment with taxable, tax deferred, and tax exempt. And then they're essentially trying to move money between, you know, tax deferred and tax exempt and leverage their taxable, you know, account to pay the taxes and survive in, in that in that window. But if they're, I think the interesting perspective is, is that if you get to a certain level of assets, you can really, and you look across long enough time horizons, you can really start to engineer your tax situation in a, in a much more meaningful way. So I just want to touch on that point. Okay. So in retirement asset allocation in the presence of non, uh, non-portfolio income sources, how they affect, how they relate to one another. I'm happy to try. So, uh, you know, there's one theory that says you may maybe try to calculate the present value of these, these guaranteed incomes, and maybe that should be part of your fixed uh, 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 bond or fixed income portfolio. And I think there's some merit to that. But for me, the starting point is, fine, you've got whatever sources of guaranteed income that covers a certain amount of expenses, what's left? How much do you need to spend beyond that? And what percentage of your portfolio does that additional expense represent is how I like to think about it. 
Because if the answer to that is 4%, so even after the guaranteed income, I need to take, let's say, 4% out of my portfolio in the first year, then I'm still at that 50 to 75% stock range. Uh, unless maybe, again, there's a, a, a countless exceptions. Maybe it's 4%, but a lot of that is for wants, not needs. And so maybe, you know, that, maybe that's your fund money and your guaranteed sources of income pay, pay the utility bills. So you know, there could be a lot of variation there. Uh, but if you're going to still need 4% from your portfolio, I think that really should, in my view, that should drive the asset allocation decision. And if the answer is, yeah, it's not that bad, I only need 1.5% or 2% of my portfolio, then frankly, at least from a you know, surviving retirement, the asset allocation at that level probably doesn't matter much. Wanted to um, talk about annuities, and we had a lively discussion about annuities at our lunch table, so I want to recapture some of that magic. Um, but annuities are starting to get more interesting, more interest, especially as yields are uh, higher, and that in turn uh, helps enhance annuity payouts. So um, maybe as a starting point, we could talk about who is the best candidate for some sort of an annuity product, and then I'd also like to talk about when, how much, and what types? Well, first, thing, first things first. So first, I know a lot of folks, they hear the, nerd, uh, hear the word annuity and they cringe or they get terrified and they want to run screaming, but annuities themselves aren't the issue. The issue is high fees and complexity. So it's not necessarily that all, that all annuities are bad, it's that those annuities that are high fee and complex, those are bad. Those are the ones that we generally want to run screaming from. Same thing when it comes to mutual funds. High fee, complicated mutual funds, really fancy active management strategy with high fees. That's what we want to run screaming from. It's not uh, all mutual funds entirely. So when it comes to annuities, simple, low-cost annuities can be a reasonable approach for some retirees. So specifically, a single premium immediate annuity, you're creating your own pension. You're going to put in a lump sum once, and then you're going to get a monthly income payment for life. And depending upon your goals and what your preferences are, that could be reasonable for you. So if you don't like managing a portfolio, then a single premium immediate annuity can be reasonable. If you are very risk averse, if you don't like seeing the value of your investments decrease, then maybe a SPIA is right for you. So you wanna look at your personal goals, your personal preferences, to figure out if a simple low cost annuity could be appropriate. One more consideration in buying a SPIA, that longevity. So if you're really concerned about outliving your money, SPIA can be a reasonable approach. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, just to riff on this a minute, I think you have to think about insurance. For, you know, it, I mean, it, it, an annuity is an insurance product. It's, it's not an investment product. And so if you're using it, think of it like insurance. So if you're buying a SPIA, you're essentially insuring I want to have a certain quality of life. If you want to layer that annuity on top of your Social Security, and if you want to... Uh, you know, buy a deferred income and annuity. Some people call it uh, longevity insurance. You know, you're basically hedging out, hey, I might live a long time. You know, one strategy some people are thinking about, but I think almost no one does is, okay, I could, I could buy a, a deferred annuity at 60, have it kick in at 85 when I'm not expected to be alive. So you can actually get quite a lot of income for a pr pretty low cost, but it does constrain your planning window because then you only have to plan for a set amount of time. So there, there's a purpose for an insurance. You're essentially leveraging your mortality credits, you're mutualizing your risk. It's it's very different than being an individual individual investor and trying to like manage your portfolio for an unknown inflation and longevity horizon. Yeah, I think it's important to to understand why you want the annuity in the first place. So like you mentioned in some cases it's longevity. You're afraid you'll live to 110. Uh, and, and that's, that's one kind, and that could dictate the type of annuity or the amount you, you put into an annuity. Uh, but for others, it's really just part of retirement planning from the very beginning. It's not so much a fear of longevity, but it's just a, a, a comfortable way to manage your portfolio. So for me, for that kind of person, the ideal candidate is someone who, one, has not undersaved for retirement in the first place, because if you have, an annuity won't save you. You haven't oversaved for retirement, because if you have, you don't need an annuity. But you're somewhere in the, in the middle, and 2022 scares you to death, and you're not sleeping well at night. It may make really good sense to annuitize a part of your portfolio. Uh, on the other hand, maybe you're very comfortable in 2022, and you haven't lost any sleep, and you're going to rebalance, and you're like, bring it. I got whatever you can bring me. 
I can take it, except for 8.2% inflation. But other than that, you know, you can, you can handle it, then, you know, annuity might not make sense, particularly if you're thinking about bequests to, to family members or charities or that sort of thing. Well, Rob, I want to pick up on something you just said, which is inflation in relation to annuities that, that, you know, if we continue to see fairly high inflation, it eats away at the purchasing power from that income stream that you're able to earn. So should that turn people off annuities? How should they think about that protecting their purchasing power if that's, if that's the goal of the annuity? Yeah, I don't think it should, it does, I don't think it disqualifies an annuity. And I'll just say right up front, I'm not an expert on annuity pricing. Uh, but, the, you know, the interest rate environment is, and, and inflation is obviously going to affect the pricing of annuities. So it's really a question of evaluating the, 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 the pricing under the economic circumstances that we have. If I were going to do that personally, I would hire someone to help me with that analysis. Obviously not someone who was going to actually sell me the annuity. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a good question, but it's all going to get factored into the pricing of annuities at some level. But whether, you know, it, it's any particular annuity is a smart purchase is just going to depend on countless factors, I think. One, one related topic on this is you can actually dollar cost average into annuities and hedge out the interest rate movements over time if you want to do it. So if you're committed to that strategy, one thing is, you know, you're accumulating and then when you go to transition, you have a five-year window or something and you start buying layers of income over time if that's what you want to do. Yeah, it's certainly not going to be a, a one for one, but we talked about, hey, spending decreases in retirement. So yes, you have some uh, risk of losing purchasing power from those annuity payments, but you're probably going to spend less money in retirement anyway. Now to manage that inflation risk, maybe it doesn't make sense to put all your money into the annuity. You're still going to have a portion of your money in a stock and bond portfolio. And that stock portion in the long term, hopefully, is going to grow more so than inflation. And that can help you with that tail end of that spending smile when you get really uh, to an advanced age, and then you have those higher medical expenses, that's when that inflation adjusted part of your portfolio, those stocks can help manage those expenses. Okay, and I wanna hit on that topic of higher uh, health care, long-term care costs um, in just a second. But before that, before we leave annuities, I want to tackle a question that came from Squirrel1963 on the Bogleheads forum. At what age should someone annuitize? That's a fantastic question. The first thing that comes to mind is going to be that fragile decade is a term by Wade Found. There's a ton of research on retirement planning, and that fragile decade is going to be those five years before and those five years after retirement. And the reason why it's that fragile decade is because you generally want to avoid having a stock market crash at that time. Now, certainly we can't avoid that, so we have to figure out what are. It's going to be our risk management tools in doing that. And having that annuity payment come in at that time is going to mean you don't need to take as much out from your portfolio. Now, being flexible with spending can also help manage risk at that time as well. Yeah, I mean, not to be self-serving, but I think this is an example of where we think people should build their financial plans and talk to a fiduciary who's completely independent about these kinds of decisions, because I mean, every situation is unique. It's, I mean, it's hard to answer that question, right? There's like a million different variables that are happening around you and your family, and what you think the future is going to hold, and your you know your your asset size and so forth. So, I mean, I think thinking through where you're at, what could happen, where you want to go, what might happen, and then intelligently hedging those risks out is a good conversation and a good use of capital. Uh, doesn't mean signing up for like a one percent, you know you know, financial advisor that's going to take that for life. It, you know, you can get a flat fee or fee only financial advice, just like you talk to your CPA these days. Yeah. I want to add one more note on annuity 101 is that this is an insurance product. This is not an investment. And on average, when you buy insurance, you lose. So if that's not a prospect that you're comfortable with, consider that in the decision to purchase an annuity. Now, in the rare event that you have prolonged life expectancy, more so than what the actuaries at the insurance company think you're going to live until, then certainly can come out ahead. But generally, you're going to buy insurance to manage risk, not to come out ahead financially. So I want to move over to a perennially hot button issue in relation to retirement planning, which is spending, safe spending. So let's just use the 4% guideline as a starting point for this discussion. Rob, I'm hoping you can start here and, and also just to keep everyone following along. 
Uh, let's talk about the 4% guideline, what it holds, what it means. Maybe you can even give an example of how that would translate into cash flows. Yeah, so the 4% rule comes initially from a paper by Bill Bengen in 1994. And uh, what he tried to determine was, as a percentage, what's the most you can spend from a portfolio in the first year, uh, such that you then adjust that amount, whatever it happens to be, a million dollar portfolio, let's say it's 40 grand, that you can adjust it by CPI uh, each year thereafter in retirement. And the goal uh, was to live 30 years with money still in the bank and then you could die. Uh, and uh, so he looked at it from 1926 to 1976, I, no, 19, yeah, to 1976, I think. Um, and uh, he found, you know, the, the amount you could take out each year and still last for 30 years, of course, varied from year to year significantly. Some years you could take out 8 or 9% in the first year. But the lowest, which I think was 1966, uh, was 4%. So that, that kind of gave us the 4% the rule, and since then there's been... Uh, just a ton of research. Michael Kitsis took it back to 1871. And so far, the, the, the worst, the lowest is 4%. It comes from, we'll call it the late 60s. Uh, why? Because of the inflation uh, that I think everyone in this room remembers. It's about in the 70s and into, eight, what, 81, 82. Uh, and the stock market returns it just crushed retirees. A very difficult time to retire. Uh, but so that got us the 4% rule. So when we think about managing sequence of risk, one way to do it is to start with a very low, you know, starting spending percentage. And if we follow the history, it's 4%. And of course, the big question is whether the 4% rule is still valid today. Do you want me to dive into that or should I stop talking? No, please. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so my view is it's still as, as valid as it's ever been. It certainly has, um, I think, some limits as to practical application. I've, I've only met one person who ever told me that in retirement they actually followed the 4% rule and that person's name was Bill Bengen. He told me that uh, about two months ago. I think as a practical matter, most retirees just, they don't, we don't think about it th that way. It might be good for planning, but at least even in 2022, I think it's still valid. Now, could we have a decade of 8% inflation? Sure, I guess we could. And, and could the stock market go sideways for a decade? And could, could it turn out that, I don't know, 2019 you know, gave us a, the 3.8% rule? Sure, that's very possible. But at least so far, what we're experiencing as difficult as it is, kind of pales in comparison to the decade or more that folks that retired in the late 60s had to live through. And I don't, I don't have an opinion as to whether that will repeat itself. I have, I have no idea. But I still think it's as valid as it's ever been from a, a planning perspective. Yeah, I think um, Carson Jeske, who's a early retirement now, early retirement now uh, you know, I think he, he's like a 3.3% safe withdrawal rate. You know, I feel like that's in the range. I mean, in general, like all of us are definitely the, the Bogon folks are, uh, you know, betting on the, the long-term productivity of the U.S. economy that it's gonna kinda of keep generally going that direction and you wanna be generally betting on that and uh, if that persists, we'll be good. I mean, I think the thing that keeps me, that I think about, if you really zoom out, is uh, did demographic trends in our country lead us down the path of Japan, which had a really long run, <laughs> bad return scenario, because I think mainly driven by demographics, although we don't, have, we don't face the same thing here, we just have to be careful about continuing to grow our productive population. I think the 4% rule of thumb is fine. What I encourage folks to consider is that, hey, Bill Bengen, he wrote this paper a few decades ago and he got 4% more recently. He's done some more research. He added small cap value to his portfolio and now it's 4.5% or 4.7%. Bill's not the only person to look at this question. A lot of folks have looked at this question and they all have come up with their own unique answer. Wade Fow, he got 2.4%. Christine Benz and her team, they did a, well, rather let me give some context. So Bill Bengen, right, historic looking performance. Christine Benz and her team, they put some numbers into a computer. The computer made up some uh, simulations and the computer said, hey, it's actually 3.3% if you can accept the 10% failure rate. And if you can't accept the 10% failure rate, now you can only take out 1.9%. Correct me if I'm wrong on, on that number. So that's to say whether you choose uh, 4% or 4.5 or, or 1.9 or the Guyton-Klinger model, which is a variable distribution strategy, which says, hey, market does well, you get to spend more. 
market is poorly and now you're gonna spend less. I think all those are fine, right? Whether you use historic, uh, based on that safe withdrawal rate, whether you use the Monte Carlo simulation, that's all okay, but you just want to look at it regularly. That's gonna be more important than whatever strategy you choose. Don't go forward blindly every single year not making any adjustments to your plan. Yeah, th thanks for that, uh, all of you. I wanna follow up. Um, it does seem like within the research about safe withdrawal rates, there's convergence around that idea that you should be variable if you possibly can make adjustments and there are all sorts of methods for making those adjustments. Any favorites if someone is going to employ a variable strategy? I'll, I'll tell one quick story about a guy I just interviewed, this guy named Joe Kuhn. So he's uh, a quick backstory. He was a plant manager and then he uh, retired at 54 and uh, started making YouTube videos and and anyway became kind of YouTube famous. You can, you can check him out. Um, I was doing a quick podcast with him. And what he's done is uh, he's got a bucket strategy, but he has four years in cash. So we were talking about the situation. He's like, well, yeah, if things stay volatile for another two and a half years, I'll start getting nervous. Now, that's a huge cash allocation, but he's basically sitting tight like, okay, whatever, I'm just going to keep spending my money. And then he's got a, a bucket and a balance fund, and he's got the rest and 100% equities. And that's how he manages it. Now he lives in Evansville, Indiana. Cost of living is lower and everything seems to be fine. So, I mean, that's one kind of massive, you know, longer cycle market timing variability approach. Yeah, a couple of thoughts here. You know, it's very difficult to know if things are going poorly. Uh, we may feel that they're going poorly you know, like in 2022. But, you know, if you look back at 1966, there was nothing going on in 1966, really, that would have said, oh, my goodness, this turns out to be the worst time to retire since the Civil War. Because the things that made 66 so bad hadn't happened yet. And it turns out if you retired in, in 1974, which was inflation was bad, stock market was bad, you actually did okay. And if you retired in 73, you barely made it. There's one year difference, uh, which can be a little unsettling, I suppose, but it, it seems to me that, uh, kind of like along what John had said, I really think it's important to continue to evaluate your spending and using whatever tools that you use, and there are plenty of great ones out there, including new, new retirement, but whatever tool you use to have an understanding of, based on Monte Carlo analysis, simulations, uh, how your retirement is looking as you move through it. If you know, it, it's difficult to come up with rules of thumb, but if you're if you're if you're actually calculating your withdrawal and, and determining what percentage of your portfolio you're taking out in a given year, uh, even if you started at four percent, you know, as inflation goes up and maybe the market goes down, you could be at five percent the next year, or six percent, or seven percent. And as you get into those numbers of six or seven percent, to me, that's when you should at least be taking a serious look at it. Uh, does it mean that, that we're in 1966 and we're going straight down? No, but it's, to me, the 6 or 7% range is sort of the canary in the coal mine, and I wanted to start taking a real look at, at my spending, and at least that's sort of my approach to it. Yeah, insofar as, hey, the market's down, should I spend less? How much less should I spend? Well, you can get really geeky with this, or you can keep it keep really simple. For example, on the really geeky front, to give an example, uh, Wade Fowl, again, he's done a lot of research on this, and he has a buffer asset strategy which says, hey, if the market's down, instead of spending for my portfolio, I am going to take money out of uh, home equity of my home, wait for the market to recover, pay it back. And to determine whether it's the right time to do that or not, you have to project what your portfolio balance is going to be over time, right? So that's a pretty key way to do it. Alternatively, hey, the market's down. Maybe this year I'm not going to take that big vacation. Maybe I'm going to wait till next year to buy a new car. Maybe I'm going to wait till next year to do a home remodel. So you don't necessarily have to take a really complicated approach to, hey, market's down. Maybe I'll spend a little bit less. John, I want to pick up on something you just said, which is uh, the reverse mortgage idea. There's been a fair amount of research in that space. Alicia Manel, uh, for example, has looked at how home equity is underutilized in a lot of households, where people are dying with a lot of housing wealth that might have improved their quality of lives. I'm wondering if the panel has any thoughts on the role of home equity potentially funding retirement needs. And it seems like that's especially relevant for people who live in very high cost places where their, where their real estate assets have escalated in value very quickly. Anyone? 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a huge factor. Essentially, for everyday Americans, half their wealth is in their house, you know, and it's largely untapped. Uh, so I think there is definitely a huge opportunity, and there's different ways you can do it. I mean, in in my family, um, my my brother's essentially done a synthetic, you know, reverse mortgage by buying my mother's house in advance and then, you know, subsidizing it. And uh, you know, between him and I, basically, he's going to get that house and. That's how it works. It's fine. You know, we did it inside the family. Uh, other families can't necessarily do that, but there are there are products. The reverse mortgage has gotten, it has a bad reputation. Um, <clears throat> it's actually gotten highly regulated. So the government's done, I think, a pretty good job of regulating out um, a lot of the, the negative features and, and making it a much more accessible product. I, I'm actually curious if it'll start getting more widely adopted and for mainstream folks because of what's happening in the equity markets right now, will people start to, you know, think more widely about, about that product? So a, a couple of thoughts on this. So insofar as the strategy, hey, access to that home equity spent from it during those market drawdowns, that there is a component of insurance to the strategy. That's to say, well, firstly, not all reverse mortgages are created equal. The home equity conversion mortgage uh, insured by the Federal Housing Administration, that is going to be probably the best tool for accessing this strategy for using this strategy in that with this particular type of program, you pay a lump sum, and I want to say it's five figures for uh, upfront insurance costs to the Federal Housing Administration, and now you get to access a line of credit on your home. So that that's not a small fee, but this is something you want to consider as a risk management tool. Is this necessarily going to generate the greatest amount of wealth over your lifetime? Maybe not, but that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it to manage risk, not necessarily to have the most money. Okay. So um, I have one more question that I definitely want to ask, and then we want to open it up for questions. We'll put the mic in the middle of the room here. Um, so my question is about long-term care and how people should address the risk of long-term care in their plans. We've all seen that the traditional long-term care insurance market has been incredibly troubled. Um, so what's the solution? Who should self-fund long-term care? Who should purchase insurance? And what do you think of the hybrid type products? Yeah, I mean, definitely long-term care has a, has a bad rap because the insurance company is um, wildly underpriced the product and then proceeded to jack up premiums on a lot of folks and a lot of folks dropped their coverage, which is terrible. And, and, and they then, then left the market. Uh, the products are, I think, getting better, uh, but it, it's, um, and I think it's, it's, I mean, at a high level, it's like, if you don't have a lot of money, you can just spend your assets down and go on Medicaid. If, if you have a lot of money, you can self-insure. If you're in the middle, that's where this product makes sense. I, I do think the hybrid product's an interesting idea, you know, but I, I don't have direct experience. I think like the idea of combining an annuity or potentially a death benefit with uh, long-term care coverage makes sense as long as you feel very confident that you understand the product, the pricing is good, and I think you also have to understand that when you get this product, you have to pass a test around, it's, they're called ADLs, activities of daily living, and so in the past, you could get this product and they could say, okay, well, actually, John, it looks like you can dress yourself and bathe yourself, so we're not gonna pay this benefit. Uh, you have to understand how that test is administered and you know what your, how you, your rights for claiming the benefit. Yeah, going back to Insurance 101, again, this is a risk management tool. On average, you buy insurance, you're going to lose, but that's not why we buy it. We buy it to manage risk. Uh, insofar as what products to buy, now you've got the two options. You've got plain vanilla insurance, you pay that annual premium, and then you'll have a bucket of money that you'll be able to access if you qualify for benefits. Those uh, two of six uh, daily living activities or you have cognitive uh, impairment. That's simple, easy to understand, and then there's the more complicated financial product. So earlier I talked about, hey, if something's complicated, generally you wanna run screaming from it, and that's gonna to apply to these long-term care hybrid policies too. Ideally, you wanna get that simple insurance product. Those more complicated products are really only a last resort's resort if you don't qualify because of underwriting requirements for a more basic, simple uh, insurance coverage. And then if you are looking at that decision, I consider folks to take a lot of time to think about that. Is this really the right product for you? And then in making that decision and in getting advice on that decision, uh, figure out who's advising you on that. That's to say, 
Don't ask the insurance salesman if you should buy long-term care insurance. Uh, get advice from someone who has expertise in the area that doesn't have that conflict of interest. This is a practical point, because uh, this, this is what we did. The benefits for, for long-term care insurance are quite limited, I think. I mean, they're gonna give you a dollar amount per day, maybe a hundred bucks for a period of time. And so what we did was said, okay, well, if we actually used up all of these benefits, what would that number be, and can we self-insure? Now, of course, the answer to that may be yes, maybe no, but I would encourage you to at least do that math. Uh, it, I can help inform the decision. One note, I just want to add on that. Certainly, there's an argument for self-funding, right? Hey, you've got the money, maybe you don't need to buy insurance coverage. Here's an argument I heard from an insurance salesman, right? So take this with a grain of salt with respect to uh, even if you do have the resources to be able to afford that coverage yourself, consider when that day comes, you might be inclined to not pay for professional services, trying to do some of that uh, in-house yourself. That's gonna be the, that survivor, or not, not the surviving spouse, but the spouse that's more abled, right? And how is that gonna impact their quality of life? So I can certainly see the argument there, but of course, again, that's also the argument being made by an insurance salesman. I have a follow-up question on that, and I just want to reiterate, we do have a mic here in the middle. If people have questions, feel free to queue up. I um, wanted to ask about the uh, people who might have life insurance and whether that can, in some cases, be transferred or switched into a product, a hybrid product that covers long-term care. I know that sometimes that can be an elegant solution if someone has some sort of a permanent life insurance product. John, you're nodding. Can you uh, talk about that? Yeah, I've only ever actually been remotely involved in, in helping a client uh, with this once, but if the question is, hey, I'm going to pay, you know, five grand a year to buy a new standalone policy, or if I can take an existing whole life insurance policy and then change that into an existing whole life insurance policy with a long-term care rider, certainly that can be more cost effective than shoveling out five grand a year every year forever. So an, a follow-up question on the topic of long-term care. I'm guessing a lot of people in this room probably fall into the self-funding category where they've uh, probably amassed sufficient assets where they feel that they could absorb a long-term care shock. So a question on that front is, how do those funds get invested, assuming they're earmarked for long-term care? And also, how do you right-size that allocation that you're setting aside, or do you even need to? How should people approach that if, if they're in the self-funding camp? And Rob, maybe since this is your approach, maybe you should grab it. That's an interesting question. I haven't thought about whether I should change my asset allocation in the event you know that we have to spend a lot on, on care. Uh, I, I've certainly factored it into potential expenses, and uh, we, can, we can cover it. I, I, at least off the top of my head, I don't see asset allocation changing. I mean, I suppose in theory, you could earmark some amount of money that says, okay, we're going to put this aside for the event, eventually for, for long-term care if that ever happened. But even then, it would be a tricky allocation because you don't know when it's going to happen. It could be tomorrow or it could be 20 years from now. Um, so I think f for me, I would probably just stick with my overall asset allocation. Uh, yeah, and, and, and then just know that I've got the assets to cover it if that should come up. to ask about the bucket approach to retirement allocation. We had a good conversation about this at lunch, and uh, I'd just like to, to get the panel's thoughts. Maybe you can each address the question of whether you think it's something people should use, whether you think they should avoid it, uh, whoever wants to jump on that one. I mean, I think that if you, like back to Carson Jeske, he, he definitely believes that it's inefficient, and you should just stay completely invested and ride it out and, and so forth, but... The bucket strategy? Okay, sure. Yeah, I mean, basically what you're doing is you're setting aside, you know, a bucket of money uh, for near-term expenses some period of time. It could be a year, it could be two or three, or in this other guy's case, you know, four years, which is a pretty long time. Uh, and so you're not getting any market returns on that money, but you're sleeping better at night. So it's a drag, essentially, on your, on your portfolio. Um, so, but I think from a simplicity and behavior and psychological perspective, it really works because people are like, okay, I have a set of money, it's like my checking account, I can live on this, essentially, they're creating a paycheck, like a, a year-long paycheck all at once, timing when they take that out, which they can control. 
So if you load it up for 2022 at the end of uh, 2021 or whatever, the latter half, you'd be good to go and you've, you're feeling like a genius. Um, and so some, some folks do do this and if, and if they stay active and they have a long period of time, I mean, they sleep well at night and, and it works for them. Uh, but it may not be the absolute perfect performer over time, but maybe you're dealing with a lot of stress because you're trying to manage that and it's, and it's somewhat complicated too. Yeah, pros and cons to any investing approach, the strategy you can stick with is likely better than the one that you can't. If a bucket strategy sounds great to you, then certainly that can be reasonable. Now cons being you're going to have that cash drag. So maybe that means you're going to have a smaller investment return and, and likely that'll be the case on a long enough timeline because cash historically hasn't done as well as intermediate term bonds over the long term. But again, that's less important than as a strategy that you can stick with. And if that's the one that sounds appealing to to you, then certainly that can be reasonable. So, so there, there's a lot here, but I won't go into all, all of it because of time. I, I, I think there's a different issues with the bucket strategy and, and why you want to use it. If the question is you want to keep a certain amount of cash before because you want to feel comfortable, then that's fine, right? I mean, as long as it's not too much. Uh, and whether you call that a bucket strategy or not, or it's just money in your checking account, and then you've got your portfolio over here, that was sort of the father of the bucket strategy, Harold Avinsky, that was his idea, two buckets, one for cash, he started at two years, it was too big of a drag on the portfolio, so he ended up taking clients down to one year, which by the way is but what Bill Bengen did, right? He pulled a year's worth of income out of, you know, in his assumption, his analysis and model. So really not much different than that. And I think that's a certainly reasonable approach. I think where I get tr have trouble with it is if we start to have multiple buckets and we start to do our asset allocation by years of expenses rather than percentages, which is how I started to think about it when I started, you know, got into the retirement uh, phase, and I, for me personally, I just found that harder to actually implement, to know when to go from one bucket to another. It was just easier for me to have whatever cash I wanted and then you know a 70-30 portfolio or whatever it's gonna be. But others might find the bucket strategy easier. You know, there might be just the opposite. So a lot of it just comes down to personal preference. But I would always think about, even if you use a bucket strategy, what is your percentage asset allocation? I wouldn't lose sight of that if you're gonna go with the the three or even more complicated bucket strategy. <laughs> okay, hi. Uh, I've read, actually it was a um, uh, Michael Kitsi's article, that there's a possibility that you can look at annuity as part of your fixed income asset portfolio, not to annotize it, you know, you'd sell it afterwards, but, but as a good source of income in terms of you know, comparatively, I'd be interested to hear what your thoughts are. Yeah, I, um, <clears throat> there's a guy, V. Bodie, that I know he's an economist and he talks about life cycle finance. And so one way you can think about your portfolio is you, let, you think about your expenses and what do you, you what, what do you have to spend, just your needs and then your likes and then your wants. And if you cover your needs with social security and annuities, uh, then theoretically you can take more risk with the rest of your portfolio. Uh, so that is one strategy is you, you basically try to hedge out, you know, the stuff that you have to have, make sure you're fully covered, and then you dial up the risk and the rest of it, and, and uh, you know, hopefully you get uh, very good long-run returns. Yeah, yeah that's certainly a pro an approach that I think a lot of people follow. You do have to do the calculation, and I can, you know, there's some assumptions in terms, including the discount rate to figure out present value, so that can just get a little dicey, but... Um, uh, the thing I would say, though, is I would still look at how much I need to pull out of my portfolio after the the annuity check comes in, and what percentage of my portfolio is that, and what is my asset allocation of that portfolio without considering the annuity. I personally feel more comfortable running through that analysis, at least as part of the process, even if for your overall asset allocation you want to view an annuity as part of the bond portfolio, which is certainly a, a reasonable and logical, I think, thing to do. Uh, but, but I would still want to know, you know, because if I'm pulling 4% out of you know, just the portfolio, and because I'm considering the annuity as part of fixed income, I have some allocation that's, say, outside 50 to 75% in stocks, which maybe you wouldn't. But if it was outside that range, it would at least be something I'd want to think about. You know, am I too far outside that range that at least history tells us could be wrong in the future, but history tells us is the range we want to have, you know, if we're somewhere around that initial 4% withdrawal rate. At least that's how I think about it. Thank you. 
Uh, hi, my, my question uh, touches on uh, several topics you brought forward. So just what a, what a great panel. Uh, uh, we've all thought about the 4% rule. Uh, and uh, several of you mentioned how many of us are in the position of having at least, well, mine is about half of my overall wealth is in my house. And I'm really loath to, uh, to take out a reverse mortgage. They've had such terrible, uh, it's, I, I really don't want to do that. But my question is this, as um, I have to laugh, I'm so far ahead of the 4% with my withdrawal just for living expenses that you know, I don't have to calculate that to see where I am. It's, it's way above that. Um, as my portfolio is going down, both because of withdrawals and because of this last year, my house value is skyrocketing and I still have a big mortgage. So my question is, do you think a home equity line of credit would be useful so that I could in effect increase my mortgage temporarily, borrowing money, Ad admittedly a line of credit is a higher, at a higher rate than a traditional mortgage. Do you think that would be advisable, sort of hoping, waiting for the market to turn around so that then I can start repaying that mortgage and the line of credit? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, if you ask Wade Fow, and that's basically what he's saying. He's uh, saying either through a HELOC or with a HECM, which is a home equity, it's basically a reverse mortgage, the government-backed version, you can also get a line of credit um, to make that available to yourself and then potentially engage in that. And essentially, you're, you, know, you could draw from that to cover your expenses instead of selling off of your depressed um, portfolio and then you're waiting essentially for the market to recover. So you have to have uh, confidence and uh, the patience to wait for the market to come back. And that's the, comes back to kind of the emotional side of managing your own behavior and feeling like you've got enough of a window to, for this to come back. I mean, I think we've gotten conditioned to markets coming back really quickly and now we'll see, you know? I mean, personally, well, I won't give my opinion on this, but yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a potential strategy, but you really should consider um, you know, forecasting it out over the over the long time horizon. Yeah. So I'm very nervous about this. This strategy gives me the heebie-jeebies. If I'm going to, you know, it's a very technical term. So 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 because first of all, you're borrowing to invest, which is effectively what you're doing. Now, some could say you're doing that if you don't pay off a mortgage, but you're doing it while in retirement, not when you're 30 and are working and have income, you know, earned income. And if it's a home equity line of credit, you're, you're subjecting you, that to interest rate risk, right? If interest rates keep going up. So uh, to me, that would be, for me, would be like the option of maybe last resort. I, I, that would make me very uh, uncomfortable. I would think more about, uh, depending on the circumstances, downsizing even. Maybe you don't want to leave the home, I know. And, or maybe you're already downsized or, you know. But it, it, for me, that would make me very uncomfortable to start borrowing out of a home equity line of credit so that I could keep more money in the market in retirement. That would, I think, it could work out, but it could also end pretty badly, I think. Okay, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Vijay from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, planning to retire in five to seven years. Question for Steve. Steve, I use new, reti new retirement, fantastic tool, um, but maybe I'm uh, lazy and uh, ignorant. I'm unable to use uh, the full potential of the tool, uh, but however, uh, Rob Berger made a video and I'm able to use the tool as far as, <laughs> you know, uh, by following Rob Berger's video. So my question is, are you guys going to collaborate and make few more of those so that people might, like me can benefit. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> it, it's a team effort. Yeah. I would say we started with power planners and that's informed what the product does. And we are working very hard to make it simpler and easier and, and uh, more accessible. Uh, you know, that we're building our own help and classes and we, we believe in we're, we're really here to try to, you know, bring literacy and planning to the mass market. That's why we've built kind of like this TurboTax equivalent and price it in a low-cost way. But, yeah, there's a ton to learn. 
there's a ton of, there's a million edge cases, a million edge cases. It's so hard. This is why it's such a hard problem and no one's really solved it. And uh, yeah, no, I mean, I appreciate that Rob has building uh, videos to make it more understandable. So thank you very much for doing that. Um, I, uh, well, in my case, uh, my wife is the brains in the family. And I don't know if there's any correlation, but she has no interest in this financial stuff, okay? Um, let's assume that we have plenty of money. We're not any risk of being near the edge. She currently has an IRA that has maybe 10% of our assets, and she's got a financial advisor for that. If I kick the bucket, I know exactly what's going to happen, and I don't want that to happen. He's going to suddenly have 10 times as much money. <clears throat> I'm wondering if you guys have any suggestions that actually work on how to do this transition <laughs> other than simplifying as much as I possibly can. Um, are there any other techniques or anything else that you can suggest so that if I pass away first, that she has some other alternative to a 1% charge on our assets? Yeah, so first things first, if you haven't done this already, make sure you've got all those estate planning documents in place, right? Will, trust, uh, power yeah, of attorney. Yeah, done that. And then, so that's the formal estate planning stuff. And then it sounds like you also have a big need for an informal estate planning document, which goes by many names, emergency letter, side letter of instruction. And what you're going to do is you're going to list out everything that's not listed out in the wills, the trust, and everything else, which is to say, uh, honey, here's the name of our estate attorney. Here's the name of our tax preparer. Here's where all our accounts are and, and how to access them. She got all that. That's okay. not the Beautiful. problem. Perfect. So it, it sounds like we have a need for a financial advisor who's going to do the asset management or maybe an uh, He's asset. He's a great guy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> that's, yeah that's, that is the issue. So, um, gosh. So the relationship component aside, because that's a whole another uh, yeah. can of worms, we need someone to manage the portfolio in your absence. So it sounds like if you want to go the portfolio route, then possibly transitioning now to a more competitively priced asset manager via- uh, Like Vanguard or something like that. Yeah. A company that starts with V, sorry. Yep, yeah, no, I mean, uh, that's fine, or a flat fee, right? You find, wanna find a flat fee asset manager, you're gonna know exactly how much you're paying to the dollar, and that can help you decide if that's a reasonable uh, price um, uh, to pay. So taking those actions now, and again, that's gonna be, uh, oh, looks like, okay. Yeah, just just real quick. I think I agree with John. I mean, there's a definite movement now for uh, flat fee, fee only advice, and it exists out there. And if if you frame it up for your wife or your family to say, okay, well, yeah, one percent, it's uh, twenty thousand a year, right? Or what the number is, and what does that buy? And would you rather pay your friend here twenty grand or give it to the grandkids or fund college or something like that? I mean, you frame up the alternative, but there's definitely. You know, you should be able to find a fiduciary advisor you can play on an hourly basis just like you pay a CPA, right, or a lawyer. So I would look more widely and, and try to have that discussion now. I agree with the risk. Thanks. So uh, super quick, I know we talked about the 4% rule. Bill Bengen, we're going to have Bill Bengen on the Bogleheads live show this December. So if you want to ask Bill Bengen, father of the 4% rule, maybe now the 4.5% rule, your questions, make sure to check that out. You can follow the Bogleheads on Twitter for dates and times. Thank you. So thank you so much, Rob, John, Steve. Thanks, thanks for being here. We're going to take a 10-minute break, or I guess like eight minutes now, and we will reconvene in this room. Rick Ferry will be interviewing Dr. Burton Malkiel. Thank you.